Good afternoon and welcome to Fire in the Belly. Today we have Phil Graham and myself, Pete Long. Good afternoon. How are you? Very well. Yourself? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on. Here in uh, sunny Northern Ireland. Sunny Northern Ireland, in your hometown, Hillsborough. <laughs> in the hometown of Hillsborough, yeah. So it's uh, on the doorstep. Yep, so, all good. Uh, Fire in the Belly, have you heard of it? Does it mean anything to you? I have not heard of the Fire in the Belly podcast until you reached out. Cool. Uh, but I am very well aware of what Fire in the Belly is and I'm really excited for this. So far away with any questions that you have. What is it to you? Tell me this. Well, Fire to Me in the Belly is waking up in the morning, super excited to face the challenges for the day, uh, to face the things that you're going to win at in the day, uh, to face the clients that you're going to work at, and basically anything that comes at you. Okay. And to be able to thoroughly enjoy it, share your wisdom, get paid for it, help other people, and build the life that you want to build. Wow, okay. So there's a lot of elements to it. You know, it's a part of getting paid with it, impacting others, and also being able to build a, a thing that you can actually enjoy and continue to, to build. And I think that, you know, that's such an important thing is the underlying vision, the underlying inspiration that you have to keep going with mm -hmm. your work mm -hmm. rather than just chasing a financial target or s significance. It's, it's something that you're willing to put up with, the highs and the lows. And, you know, if you've been in business for a while, you know that there's plenty of that. Yeah. And um, I think a lot of people that when they first started in entrepreneurship, they think that it's all going to be plain sailing. Sure. They're looking for uh, easy targets. They're looking for linear progress. And it's never, ever, ever going to be like that. Sure. So, you know, being able to face those challenges and look at them and actually go, well, I actually enjoyed that. That's taught me to be a better leader. That's taught me to build a better business. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of beauty and there's a lot of growth and challenges and it's being excited for that. So I think, you know, fire in the belly is not all about the wins. It's about the chaos that comes with it and being able to leverage that as best you can so yeah are you a chaos creature do you enjoy the chaos or is it a i do at certain points there's certain times where it gets <laughs> a little bit too much and you know the, the the way i look at chaos in business is you know i was a, a very successful bodybuilder uh -huh. in my earlier days and like obviously that's not a big focus for me now but um i look at it as last sort of you know the last set when you're pushing through sure and you know the the tension the fatigue you're, you're going, you're visioning it in your mind and you're just pushing through it and you're pushing through those reps and that's what creates the adaptation. That's what creates the growth. That's what breaks down the tissue and that's what allows you to become a better bodybuilder. And that's, that's what it. builds strength. Um, you can't build strength without resistance. So in my head, I've got that analogy of, right, if I'm going through this here, what is it teaching me? How is it serving me? What can it give me? Um, what is it teaching me about this client? What is it teaching me about myself? What is it teaching me about my systems, my operations, my my just my overall business structure and like how can I make it better because this is a problem that shouldn't have happened it's happened how can I reverse engineer it now and then actually frame it mm, so okay. that's a big big thing for me there's quite a lot of internal commentary going on there is that a, yeah is that a, a lot like I, I'm massive into uh, mental mental models and frameworks and stuff just for fast decision making okay um after managing a lot of clients and doing a lot of things you have to be very efficient and effective in how you make decisions and stuff. Mm. Um, so, you know, I've been caught up in situations before and, you know, as entrepreneurs where we run into challenges and it eats up the whole day sure. and it eats up the whole week and then it eats up personal relationships and you're just not present with anything. So I want to protect myself as much as possible from that eating into my time and ruining my life. Sure. So, you know, I've got a, a strong internal dialogue there that really makes me, you know, look at the stuff that I'm going through and go, right, how can I, how can I leverage this? the best way to can use you, it can you spot that in yourself or do you, do you do you have external sort of influence to do that or um i've been able to spot it in myself now and i mean you know there's not a day goes by where i wake up and i don't have a challenge sure um i'm very much into reflecting about my life in order to make it better um to, to make you know to, to master myself and make my own self-control better and stronger mm. um my decision making as objective as possible and to be mindful of blind spots and I'm very open-minded. Um, I think, you know, when I was earlier on in my career, I was very close-minded, my way or the highway, um, sensitive to things. And you have to go through a lot of that to be able to mature and grow as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, because entrepreneurship is very vulnerable. Uh, it's very challenging. You know, you're responsible for putting bread on the table every single day. There's things that happen outside of your control and whatever. And it's about, it's about perspective and, Really, really looking at how that, you know, can serve you in a way and not getting stuck in the mud. Sure. And I'm, you know, I'm human. I get stuck in the mud for periods of time, but, you know, I'll do my best to work out of it. And if I don't know how to work out of it, I'll reach out and ask for help or I'll just take action in one direction. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, fair play. So, Hillsborough born and bred? Hillsborough born and bred. Yep, I am indeed. 
Mm-hmm. I, was, well, I was born in Belfast, but I was brought up in Lisburn slash Hillsborough. So we sort of call this grand area Lisburn. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, now I'm a little bit older, yeah, it's, I call it Hillsborough. But uh, yeah, no, I love here. We're, we're close to the lake. I was out earlier on there by the lake and it's quiet here. Local town, village is good. Everything's great. And yeah. We're close to Dublin. We're close to Belfast. We're close to the airports. And yeah, it's super awesome. awesome. Yeah. So going through school and all that, I mean, what were you have seen as a, as a, a young Phil? Yeah. Okay. My, my, my life's been quite interesting. I don't know if you know much about it, but uh, long story short, uh, sort of the whole reason why I ended up here and, mm. and why I'm in this situation, why I'm living here was when I was 16 years of age, um, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes mm-hmm. and at that age I was overweight. I was inactive. I was brought up in a, you know, a, a family where it was very middle class. I um, was always told to work hard. Money doesn't grow on trees. Keep yourself small, never get too big. That kind of whole just Northern Ireland mindset of just mm-hmm. work hard and keep your head down and sleep in your bed at night. And, uh, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes uh, when I was 16 okay. and, I remember diabetes in your family or anything, or was it no diabetes in the family? Um, but when I was diagnosed with type one, um, I was literally told, you know, within the space of a matter of minutes, mm-hmm. that if you don't control this, you're going to die. Okay, in a roundabout way, and when you are confronted with um, a circumstance like that, you can do all the mindset stuff that you want, but when you're faced with an actual challenge like that, that's the true test. Yeah, of your character and what you can do about it. And I think it really boils down to simple questioning. What can I do right now? What is the best thing that I can do right now to to survive and thrive? And I remember when I was first diagnosed, uh, I I can tell you the story of how it exactly went down and everything else. Uh, I went to Inst. Mm -hmm. Uh, We are about half a mile away from the bus stop that I used to get the bus into Mm -hmm. Inst every morning. Um, Me and a group of lads and my brother... I uh, used to get the bus into you know the Europa bus station, mm-hmm, yeah. and uh, opposite that there was a, a coffee shop called the Scallop Shell. I don't know if you ever remember it. Don't remember that. Um, anyway, they did these amazing Ulster fries, <laughs> and uh, so to say, I was a little telly tubby back then. The sugar in my tea, massive big fry pancakes, and then around the centre afterwards for a parade and a wine bar. Right, <laughs> like I didn't need any more calories. So I remember distinctly going to school one day and. My eyesight was a little bit blurry. And as humans, we're very good at, you know, picking up differences or patterns or things that are out of the norm. And I noticed that these card number plates were just very, very blurry. And I thought, my eyesight isn't as sharp as what it normally is. Went on another couple of days. It got progressively worse. Mm-hmm. Said to my mom about it. And she said, oh, I might need to book you in for an eye test. Went on another couple of days whilst I was still continuing to feed myself with soda farls and Wham bars and all the, all the rest of the good <laughs> stuff, right? And uh, yeah, then I started going to the toilet a lot, started urinating a lot, and I was like going out of class all the time. And the teacher was like, What are you doing? Are you going on your mobile mm. phone or something? Like that? And um, yeah, I said to my mom, booked in for an appointment. Long story short, got diagnosed with diabetes. She broke down in tears. I went, Mom's crying. That's a bad thing. Um, what's going down here? Yeah. Was marched down a hallway. If you've been into a hospital, city hospital, you'll know like those green olive doors, mm-hmm, like just mm-hmm. this real clinical stuff. And there was like posters in the wall and stuff of like, you know, like like diabetic amputation or like diabetes go blind and all this kind of shit. And I was like, oh, what the hell's going on yeah. here? And I remember sitting with a diabetes educator, um, Margaret Devlin, she was called, she's actually dead now, rest in peace. And I spoke with her and long story short, in that conversation, there were a handful of words that really spoke out to me and inspired hope. I noticed that a lot of their language was, you know, could, might, potentially, may. There was no definites in the language that mm. they were using. So that was the first thing that registered with me is there's hope. That's quite, you're, you're quite intuitive at that right? point to pick yeah, up on that. Yeah, very much, right, there's hope. So then I picked up, right, okay, hope, right, what are the, okay, so that's my goal is to, to live with this, to be able to manage it and whatever. And back then they had, you know, all oh, you're still going to be able to go and play sport and stuff. Like, you know, Steve Redgrave, the rower, mm-hmm. his type one diabetic, he was on mm-hmm. the back of the catalogs packets. Remember, yeah, remember yeah, that yeah. guy, right? So this was, this was like the role model back then, right? Mm-hmm. This was like before social media and all that kind of stuff really existed. So you're 31. Uh, right? I'm th- uh, yeah, just turned 32. Okay. 14th of January. And, um, 
This was what two thousand. <laughs> can't do the math. Jesus. Yeah, I think it was. B- yeah, it was like bef- MySpace back then, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Bebo was after that actually. So um, I wasn't on MySpace, but I was on Bebo, and um, yeah. So I remember her chatting about nutrition, uh, exercise, uh, mindset, medication, and lifestyle, and those were the areas in my life that I locked on to and went, those are the very things that I got to master. Mm. So literally after that, I became engrossed in reading about physiology and how the human body works and nutrition in an attempt to understand what was wrong with my, 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 my body and how I could actually live with it. And that turned into a massive hobby and pastime. Then I fell into the gym, I picked up my first weight, fell in love and, um, basically from that took up bodybuilding went and competed and won various shows and titles all across the world at a very very young age um and all the stuff that i did in bodybuilding without going into too much depth with it was stuff that i was told you'll never be able to do that with your condition and if you know if you you're familiar with bodybuilding bodybuilding is probably one of the hardest and mentally challenging things you can do not only physically but mentally and the consistency and the patience involved in it um and to, to put your body through it's 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 extremely stressful i wouldn't say in any way shape or form it is a, a healthful endeavor there can be parts of it that can be destructive sure. um but it was my i linked it very much to the the values that I got from nutrition, training, mindset, and everything else. Okay. And I used it as sort of like a, a tool to keep me accountable for diabetes. Okay. So the diabetes was my investment of my time and my energy. And I put everything in there and I was able to travel. I was able to make friends with it. And then coming towards the, the point of leaving school, mm. um, it was like, what do you want to do with your life? And one of my biggest dreams was to become a dietitian mm-hmm. to, to, to work with nutrition and to help people with their diet because I was so interested in it. Um, I love physiology. I love how the body works. Which is kind of ironic uh, considering you're choking down soda farls and wham bars. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, so I went from the complete opposite to well, the the complete, you know, vice versa, polar opposite really, right? And was the diagnosis the tipping point? Or the was diagnosis it? was the tipping point because I never valued my health before and then I was brought to the point where I had an ultimatum where I had to value my health. Okay. So that's why it became a value, uh, a massive value in my life. You know, health, you know, how, how can I, you know, I was always asking, how can I make the book go faster? How can I optimize my thinking? How can I optimize my nutrition, my longevity, my life, my blood sugar management? Um, and, um, you know, like diabetes is a very, very challenging condition to live with, but it doesn't rule me. I rule it. Sure. Um, I know what I'm doing. I keep myself accountable. I track and I monitor it. Diabetes has never interfered with my life. And when I look at people who haven't mastered it or haven't gone into it as extreme as I have, I wouldn't wish it upon my own worst enemy if, you know, if, if that was a case. And um, it's a lot of accountability. It's like looking after another kid. Mm. You know, I have to manually manage my blood glucose levels, which is, you know, it's, to me now it's second nature, yeah. but to a normal person who doesn't have it, it could be, you know, it's, it's quite challenging on top of trying to have a life on top yeah. of trying to run a business and whatever. So long story short, I went to university, went in and studied clinical nutrition in Queens, biochemistry. And when I was in Queens, I mean, I was training, I was a, an internationally known bodybuilder. I was one of the world's top junior bodybuilders mm-hmm. and uh, people had gone to recognize what I was doing. I had an education, I had a great physique, I had a lot of authority with what I was doing. And a lot of people reached out and asked me for diet plans, training programs, and this and that. And um, very, very quickly, I established myself as one of the go-to trainers in Ireland mm. uh, for physique competitions and also for people that just wanted to lose fat because I was an educated, a very, very educated personal trainer. Sure. And that led into education, public speaking, uh, writing books. I wrote uh, the world's best-selling encyclopedia on diabetes and muscle building. Mm. I uh, wrote that three years ago now. We've just sold over, I think it's just tipped over 50,000 copies now wow. um, for that specific niche. So it's yeah. a very tight niche and we I built a big community with that. And um, yeah, I mean, in Northern Ireland, I mean, you know, any any personal trainer or individual in the, the fitness scene and that has done well, I've usually mentored or coached. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, that... Then went on to education, started writing. I wrote for the Daily Mail for a while. Um, I was speaking, spoken all over the world with it, nutrition and training. And then 
all of a sudden I started to get more personal trainers and coaches that reached out to me and goes, how did you grow your business? How did you do this? How did you get clients? And I started to take them on as clients and just started to help them. And then it wasn't long until I realized I'm giving you guys all my flipping stuff here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to start charging more for this. And then gradually what happened is I stopped personal training. I went more into the education. And then after the education, I went more into the business side of things. Sure. So, you know, now, you know, with respect to what I do, I mean, I'm internationally known for helping fitness business owners, gym owners, online coaches, personal trainers scale their business. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a very tight market that I work in, in terms of that's what my main focus is. And um, yeah, I mean, I, st I, I still travel and speak all over the world. Last year I was in Dubai, I was in Portugal, LA, like, you know, um, I, I've been very grateful to have some strong connections over the world, in the world with fitness and from my nutrition backgrounds and it's just stemmed and growing completely organically but you know that all wouldn't be possible without diabetes so i've mm. got a massive element of gratitude for diabetes so it doesn't control me or, 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 or rule me in that sense i don't wake up and wish i don't have that if i didn't have diabetes i wouldn't have anything that i, yeah. that I have so it's been you know it's been a real driving force and that's an example of how a chaotic situation can lead to you know growth if you leverage it correctly sure. so you know the way i think i like to think of well if that's the case for a situation like that that can be replicated with other things mm -hmm. so that's really how i think about things and it's really just about you know zooming out and getting perspective and i think you have to go through uh, a little bit of pain and uncertainty through some situations in order to break out and find it because not everybody's not every you know we can talk about gratitude all day long and write your journal and all this kind of bullshit most people do that and have no real intention of what it's actually doing. Okay. And, you know, if you are going to properly leverage that as a tool um, to to grow your life and grow your business, you have to be very proactive in searching for meaning from those things. Mm. And if you're not finding the meaning from those things, then you've got no real reason to keep going. Sure. So, you know, it, 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 I, I'm, you know, like I said, I'm massive into, you know, looking at how those situations, I can derive gratitude from them and actually use that as you know, meaningful fuel to, to drive me forward. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that, that's that's how I see it. But hey, I mean, that's an interesting <laughs> take because you have somebody present, somebody else presented with that. And this is, I suppose for me, is fire in the belly. It's like mm. somebody else could be presented with those facts. You have class one diabetes. Yeah. Or type one diabetes. Um, and it's a completely different response. Yeah. Very, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a very good point. And, you know, I suppose the question is how and why. Um I mean, I went searching for answers. Mm -hmm. um, I think at that moment in my life when I was diagnosed, um, I was sort of, you know, I wasn't, I was, I was 16. I didn't know much about life, but I mean, my life was very, it was very vanilla. It was very average, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's always something inside us about being greater, about growing, about being stronger. And, you know, in those situations, I suppose it was just a matter of how can I get through this? Sure. And that led to one thing after the other, and it's about being consistent, you know? I knew that Rome wasn't gonna be built in a day, it was consistent, and you know, if you wanna achieve something, it's consistent actions day in, day out, and uh, focus on targets, you know? Mm -hmm. And those targets became clearer and clearer and clearer. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not the kind of guy that, um, excuse me, I'm not the kind of guy that believes in setting 10-year goals or five-year goals. Okay. Um, I, I sort of believe that's bullshit because it's so far away from where you are right now. Mm -hmm that so much can happen. I think having a rough idea sure. is a better way to look at it and thinking more acutely like a year, quarters, months, weeks, mm. and then building up to that. Yeah. I mean, 10 years, you could say you want to have X, Y, and Z, but you, in terms of trying to go there in detail, yeah. I think that there's just so much that can happen. You can write it out, but I mean, you got to focus on like reverse engineer the process, focus on the immediate that's leading to that. Sure. And also as well, you know, being willing to change your mind. Mm. Um, I was, uh, you know, one of my main goals was to be, you know, Mr. Universe, Mr. Britain. And I was only a young kid competing against guys that were, you know, 15, 20 years older than me. But I don't have an, I don't have a goal of, or vision of doing that anymore. I changed my mind because mm -hmm. I realized that there was other areas of life uh, that I wanted to, to live and thrive in. And, you know, uh, I was able to identify those now and lock onto those and, I think being able to change your mind and have the confidence to change your mind and go towards something that's going to benefit you more is a very hard thing to do for a lot of people sure. because they're worried what other people are going to think when they change their mind and they're worried about uh, failing. Um, they're worried about their own self-confidence and how they can achieve that. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, that was a, a hard thing for me was letting go of the bodybuilding identity. I had to, I had to assassinate that person and rebuild somebody else. It's pretty severe. So, <laughs> yeah. But it, it's, well, you know, if you've been bodybuilding, you know, for 18, from, from, from 16 years of age, and you've been waking up every day, going to the gym and eating a set diet and training regime with a vision of being on a stage like, you know, Schwarzenegger here mm. in front of thousands of people. And, you know, when you look at bodybuilding, it's a demonstration of power, masculinity and stuff like that. It's a very heightened level of significance. Sure. Um, and when you have conditioned yourself for years to go towards that, like a laser, mm -hmm. and like, you know, if you're a true bodybuilder, it's like a soldier, you're on a mission to get something and you'll sure. do whatever you, you need to do to get there. To try and dissolve that requires a little bit of like deconstructing stuff. So. Sure. And was there a tipping point at that? I mean, to, to, to take such a change in value set? Is it a value yeah, set that's value changed? Set, I mean, yeah, the value set and priorities for 100%, yeah. Is, do you know why that happened or is it just? Yeah. Um, I got, so it boiled down to, I had one of my last competitions when I was 25 or some 25, 26, 26 I think it was. And I got second okay. in a competition and it was one of those ones where it was very close, okay. uh, like a point. And I was coming off stage and a load of people were saying to me, you should have got that. You should have done this. And I thought I had it. Yeah. It was part of me thought mm, maybe it's just, a, and it was one of those things. And then I came off stage and I went, you know what? I've put all this money, all this time, all this stuff into something that's not sustainable. And I've got so much opportunity in other areas of my life that I'm not taking right now. And this is never going to fulfill me uh, or be able to support me financially as much as these other things could. Sure. And that was the bit where I looked at it. And when I say financially, I don't mean that in terms of just going after money. Mm -hmm. Money is a very important thing for me because it's a, it, it is a direct indicator of how much that you are serving people and how much uh, value you're adding to their life. And if you're making a lot of money, it's because you're doing a very good fucking job. Okay. And it's about doing that repetitively over time. Okay. It's not about doing it well for a year. It's about mm -hmm. doing it well for 50 years. Sure. Right? And um, I connected the service element, helping others with the wealth element. Mm -hmm. And when you say about fire in the belly, I mean, wealth, well-being, whatever way you want to define it. Um, I was doing something that I was loved, charging fairly for the service, and I enjoyed it. Mm. So, you know, and there's challenges and there's layers, you know. And I think making sure that those layers are highly specific to me, because mm. as an entrepreneur and something that I, I'm immune to now, much more so than what I was when I was younger, is, you know, that whole comparison trap. And especially now you've got social media. I mean... You know, I've been in the sort of the, the business mentoring space and the marketing space for quite a while, and there's just so much horseradish out there, <laughs> right? In terms of what people are saying that they're doing, this and that. You know, I always followed a very simple principle in life: a rich man doesn't need to tell he's rich. Mm. You know what I mean? And I always, I always approach my life with you know the difference between power and force. Okay. Yeah. That's a big, big thing. I'm a big, big fan of the de-hawking stuff, if you've ever read it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, force is trying to get a point across with power is just there. Yeah. You know, and I think that kind of, there's a lot of power in silence. You know, there's a lot of curiosity around it. There's a lot of, you know, and, you know, again, that your actions speak, that sure. words speak. I'm one of those guys that, you know, you'll be silent in the background and you'll, just, you'll, you'll visually see it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's not about, you know, saying, you know, it's about walk on the walk, not just talk on the talk. Sure. You know, and there's a, the entrepreneur space, there's a lot of, a lot of hype, a lot of talk on the talk and, you know, a lot of, a lot of newbies that are starting out that aren't seasoned that see, oh, this is what's possible and going into it and then realizing it's not all there and, mm. you know. Where's that coming from? I mean, there is a, there is a, a big inset of. Because I work with so many individuals that ch are, are struggling with that. Mm. Um, and it's an issue that I have to periodically resolve and dissolve all the time. Okay. Um, false expectations of what they think they can achieve um, based upon what they're comparing themselves to, not being happy and fulfilled. We have a trainer, a trainer the other day um, doing around about 8K a month, which is about near 90, 90K a year, mm -hmm. which is a pretty solid salary in the UK, sure. uh, thinking that he's not doing well enough okay. because he's worried about somebody doing 12K. Mm. You know, he hasn't got a bullet flying over his head. He's not lying with his kid in his arms of, you know, mm -hmm. his house blowing up, you know, like first world fucking problems. Yeah. You know, so it's about perspective. And, 
you know, when somebody's like feeling sad or annoyed about like a, like a 3K gap in their fucking wage, mm. like get a fucking grip. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like if you're worried about that, like you're not, you're not going to be successful. You know what I mean? It's, I deal with a lot of stuff like that. So it's, it's probably coming, you know, um, why I talk about it a lot is because I'm so conditioned to talking to, to my audience for so long. Sure. But, you know, uh, you know, I've been in circles where, you know, people that are, you know, making one million a year are worried about the guy making two and they're worried. Sure. So when you start comparing and stuff like that, I think that's just futile. I just think that's a, mm. it's important to get inspiration off people, but yeah. You mentioned there a while back just about business plans. Yes. Um, I mean, do you, do you actively follow business plans? And Well, I suppose there's a difference between business plans in terms of a formal business plan that you would present to a bank. And uh, and the straight answer to that is no, but I do honestly think that you, as an entrepreneur, need to periodically take time to stop, take Mm. a bird's eye view of your business and identify where is the weak point or the bottleneck that I need to remove to allow me to make more money, make a bigger impact and have more freedom. So when you say business plan, um, you know, I call it strategic business planning where it should be, right, what's the key priority right now? What are the action steps? Go. Mm. And that is, you know, ongoing throughout the period of, the time that you're running the business. Yeah. I and mean, if you're not planning, you've got no optics. If you've got no optics, you can't fucking see, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Um, again, another challenge that I come across with a lot of entrepreneurs is they get to a point where they're comfortable and their current vision is, um, you know, smaller than their actual reality or vice versa. Okay. And then they, they lose their shit and they just go all over the place. Mm. So, I mean, making sure that you're constantly reinventing that vision, setting bigger targets, working towards it, Um, And also as well, stabilizing, you know, making sure, right, okay, if I've got this business to this point, can I stabilize it right now? Mm -hmm. Most businesses die of indigestion, not starvation. Okay. So they, you know, they take on too many clients. They can't fulfill the clients. Clients get pissed off. Churn rate goes up. Refunds go up. Reputation ruined. Confidence shattered, you know, so making sure, depending on what business it is, but, you know, I always have a very simple principle. If, If you automatically had 100 clients right now, what's the first thing that would break? Mm-hmm. In most cases, it's going to be you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, um, some some thoughts on that. Yeah. So. Would you say you are typically pain-driven or are you, would you be pleasure-driven or, you know? I mean, you- pain-driven and pleasure-driven. I mean, look, I mean, my, my, my principle for life is simple. I just want to become a better human being and love myself more and more each day. Okay. It's as simple as that. I went through a large part of my life where, you know, from being overweight with the diabetes that there was a lot of, you know, um, stuff there where I felt I wasn't good enough or I wasn't, you know, in in good enough shape or I wasn't respected enough. Um, You know, that was the fuel that got me to be proactive to work towards those areas. Mm. Um, You know, I just want to become a better human, you know, want to serve humanity um, change as many lives as possible, get paid for it, have my freedom, have control of my time, love what I do and continue to learn and learn and learn. Do you know why you want to become a better human? Why do I want to become a better human? Mm. So that I can help serve others, so that I can live longer and enjoy this amazing life that I've been graced with. Cool. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting that not everyone values <laughs> themselves that way. Yeah. You know, and well, I love life. I mean, you know, like I've been through some major challenges, diabetes being one of them, and there's many more. But, you know, I've always had an affirmation, life is beautiful. And, you know, whatever way you look at it, it is. I mean, when you get perspective from all these chaotic situations that you've been through, um, you know, you, you get to see it. And I mean, I've been on both sides of the fence. I've, you know, had a peer group that has been very violent, very aggressive. I worked the door for years. I've seen the drugs. I've seen the relationship breakdowns. And then I've also been on the extreme other side where I've seen the wealth. I've seen the betrayal. I've seen the narcissism. Mm. And then I've been in the middle, you know, and then I've been, you know, I've seen at this age, you know, I'm like, like the whole world, the whole, everything fascinates me. And I'm always trying to look at how, you know, things can be picked apart in order to, to know myself more. Mm. And uh, that's becoming more and more and more apparent as I get older. Mm. Um, but I mean, you know, it's, it all starts with you. I mean, if you're not looking after yourself, you can't expect to, to love anyone else or look after anyone else, you know? Sure. And um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, life's awesome, so. And where would you say you are in that journey? I mean, of self-development or self-mastery, if... 
Well, I'm still a student. I'm still very much in the beginner stage. Mm. I don't think you could say that you have mastered life in any way, shape or form. I still wake up every single day and ask myself, what's the fucking point? Mm -hmm. I still worry about stupid stuff. There's times where I'm elated and I'm, you know, focused. There's times where I'm bored. Um, But on the grand scheme of things, I'm generally a fucking rock solid mood. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, with events and everything like that, if, you know, if I'm going to be leading other people, I got to be leading by example. Sure. And, you know, that energy is infectious in every way, shape and form. So I want to, I just want to make sure that I'm, you know, in tip top form mentally, physically, and, you know, a life worth living is, needs to be well inspected and periodically reviewed. And I'd say the same for a bit of business as well, you know, sure. and, um, you know, I'm one of those guys, I'm, I'm a straight talker. I'm one of those guys that would offend you very quick, but I don't mean it in an offensive way. I just tell it as it, as it is. Mm. I call bullshit when I see it. Um, you know, like I said, I've had a lot of experience of being in different environments. So, you know, I can read people very, very well. And mm. um, I have my own flaws, my own blind spots. And, you know, I'm, I'm skilled in certain things, terrible at other fucking things. I'll put my hand up and say, don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, my, I've been trying to build my character for years and I'm, you know, proactively trying to do that every, every other hour of my life, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. So where, where does that straight talker come from? I mean, is it, is this a straight talker? Well, when you're trying to lead a lot of people and I have a book now, nearly 500 plus clients, you, you don't have time for waffle. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's getting to the point fast to solve solutions. Sure. Um, calling things out when you don't think that they're right or they're misaligned with what, what I believe in. Okay. Um, and it's just getting to the point fast. It's efficiency. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. So Makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's just quick to the point, mm -hmm. right? You know, you know, the whole saying, beat about the bush, mm -hmm. you know, it's the point. You beat about the bush, you end up causing yourself more pain. You don't get the answers that you, you want. And then you end up having people that are given flaky answers, mm. you know, um, the more certain you are, the more, the more you can, the better you can articulate. It's as sure. simple as that, you know. Is there, I mean, is there anyone in your life that you've known to speak in that way, or is it it's just almost your own model? Or, well, I suppose if you look at anybody who's skilled in a particular mm. uh, subject, they can articulate it very well, and I think that articulation comes down to skill gap. Okay. So, you know, I mean, there there's countless people that are very certain in what areas they're talking about, whether it's marketing, mindset, sales, property. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we were talking a little bit there about property. I mean, I, did, did I sound certain? Did I, I don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Yeah. Right? Well, you do, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not, you know, it all depends on what the skill set is, yeah. you know? So um, we've got a videographer here. He'd be able to tell you how to shoot the angles and stuff. And I'd be like, yeah, well, cool. great. <laughs> so, you know, I, it, it's it's boils down to skill set mm. skill set uh experience and wisdom and, they, and you know wisdom comes from mm. the wins and the losses right so delegation is is quite a hard thing to get your head around for a lot mm. of people because it's letting go of control it's paying something that you're not seeing out immediately sure but i think you know the longer and longer that i've been in business the more i've been able to appreciate the value of doing that mm -hmm. um and again, it's about having clear processes and handovers and being very clear on the context of what's being done and why it's important. Sure. You know, so, yeah. yeah it's, uh, it's always, I mean, some people is deep immersion. It's, yeah, it's yeah. knowing your strengths and your weaknesses. I mean. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you can't be a jack of all trades, master of none, right? Mm. So, yeah. But your career side is quite interesting, I suppose, you, you know, obviously from the bodybuilding right through to, you know, the training and the business The side. bodybuilding mindset has been put into the business. Mm mindset um and public speaking is sort of like my bodybuilding now if that makes sense so did you get a buzz from it oh yeah i love it mm -hmm. i love public speaking i've been public speaking since i was 18 19 years of age mm -hmm. i am um, speaking next week speaking last week and you know it's the the, the, the solid healthy crowds you know what i mean sure. um but uh yeah i love it i mean it's natural now i mean i used to be you know, nervous about going up on stage and, 
you know, I remember the first, one of the first talks I did was at a big exhibition event. I was like, I was sweating so much. It was like, <laughs> I was like, I think like, I, think I nearly broke the microphone with the sweat. <laughs> um, and I went so, I went so over the top with detail, right. trying to teach. Mm. And again, another really important skill that I feel that I am very good at is making very complex stuff simple. Okay. And simplifying it with common sense and just straight up yes, no, direct answers mm-hmm. with obviously some scope for, for options if needs be. So, you know. What do you tend to find then? Because I'm assuming, whilst well, not exclusively, you're going to have a lot of PTs. Yeah. Would that be the, the, the vast majority of your business? Uh, to be honest, at the moment, it's largely people that are in the fitness space, personal trainers, coaches, gym owners, which is a very 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 big market i mean the fitness industry is so big now it's thriving everybody's overweight there's no shortage of work for those guys so it's a very healthy market to be in um i have had a number of business owners that have reached out to me every single week asking do i do it my answer is no uh, quite simply because my focus is on my industry at the moment um I have got a concept or an idea of doing like a, a, some kind of meal leadership um, program for meal entrepreneurs or high net worth individuals down the line, but I'm going to stick with what I know and what I'm strong at at the moment sure. and then potentially leverage that later on if I decide to go that way. Mm. Well, it's great to see that. Obviously, you've always options in the market, you know. It's- yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that it'll come at the right time, but at the moment now I'm serving the people that need me the most. mm mm-hmm. And what do you tend to find is the so the value sets coming in and, and what are people typically searching for? Well, most people are searching for a combination of either more income for more certainty and more safety, more freedom, people especially with families. And you get the odd person that comes in with a focus on impact and service. Okay. But normally when somebody begins to appreciate themselves and be able to sell what they feel that they're worth and be recognized for it and respected for it, then their ability to serve goes up. Sure. And then the ability to have freedom to recharge, rethink, and be a visionary entrepreneur instead of a tactical entrepreneur is a, a huge big thing because most entrepreneurs get in their own fucking way. Mm. We're all guilty of it. Why though? Why? Because they're afraid to delegate. They're afraid to spend money on delegation. Um, they don't trust other people to do their stuff because mm. they don't have any clear processes or handovers. Um, they're worried about failing. They're worried about, you know... Um, a whole, there's a whole can't hire the right people don't know what to do not technically adapt not you know not able to articulate what they need done mm-hmm. haven't done the actual time studies to look at what were the bottlenecks here what i need to do mm-hmm. and then the whole hassle of it right i'm just more comfortable doing it myself mm. it's going to take energy it takes energy to onboard somebody sure and then they're coming inside your company and they're seeing what you're doing and whatever and yeah you're you know you're opening up a potential Box, Pandora's box there. Yeah, so. yeah, bringing somebody else into your business is mm. it's tough. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, if you want to have a great team, they have to have transparency and everything, right? Mm. So, yeah. How do you, I mean, how do you bring that value set into the likes of a business, you know, where it is greater than you? Well, again, I, I'm massive into, like, doing stuff in principles and numbers. Um, so if I'm going to go completely random with this, mm. I think it's, you know, if you've got a team, it's about making them very, very clear as to what your mission is and what your purpose is. Okay. Being very, very clear on that. Number two is to demonstrate that in front of stage and behind the scenes. Okay. And being very, very clear as to why you're taking clients on and what your purpose with those clients is. Mm-hmm. And three, being able to demonstrate results, get results. Um, there's a lot of, you know, very fairy stuff out there that's promising results that actually doesn't fucking deliver. Mm. And you know, making sure that the quality of clientele that actually comes on is a right fit for the program sure. instead of you just taking on every person, making sure that the people that you take on are actually a fit. And if they're a fit, they're going to, you know, accelerate their growth because they're going to fit perfectly with what you teach. Um, and then also public demonstrations of making sure, you know, like somebody asked me um, at one of the last events, what would I be doing in five years or something like that? And it was like, you know, I'll still be traveling. I'll still be trying to become a better person and I'll still be changing lives and like I like, fucking started crying and shit mm-hmm. and that just came out of nowhere so you know I don't think you can fake conviction mm-hmm. and I think if your team see that they see you going the extra mile um, 
you know, like, you know, my clients' results mean the world to me because if I can help them, they're walking, talking business cards for me. Sure. And, um, you know, you've got to think about these clients is reducing advertisement cost, uh, reducing the effort and energy that needs to go into marketing. If you, if you've used any Facebook ads or anything like that, the expense is going up because everybody's trying to do it. Everybody's trying to sell the same fucking thing. Sure. And you know, if you've got, if you're doing a great job of your clients, like, like, you know, I have a business now that has hundreds of clients in it and we haven't spent a penny on advertising, not a fucking penny, not one penny. Go and look at my accounts. Zero. Wow. Why? Results referrals, word of mouth, does a great job, etc. Mm. We help. There are people in my programs, some people that don't get results. They're the first people that'll put their hand up and go, I didn't do the work. Mm. There are also people on that that have radically changed their life, sure. right? And I think it's the same. If you look at a PT or any gym, you're going to get clients there that don't show up, don't turn up. You probably work with clients that have gone, oh, here, I'll go on a joint venture with you. And then you're like, this guy's not even like putting the effort in to show up. Sure. So... You know that we're really, really big on qualifying the right people okay. and turning and saying no to people as well. You know, you know what? You might be better suited going to go into that. Well, who is your avatar then on that? I mean, is, is there? Well, we 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 well in terms of avatar, we we classify. We've got three different groups, okay. uh, and they're classified on income. Quite simply, because different income levels, different problems, different challenges, and then we've got obviously different business genres: gym owners, online coaches, PTs. People with teams, people without with teams, there's various different problems, but generally speaking, most of them are overworked. Most of them are not undercharging. Most of them don't know how to systemize a business. And yeah, most of them lack vision. They, they've got it to a point where it's only so big and they don't know how to get it to the next level. Mm. Sure. Is that just, is it lack of knowledge or is it just snow blind? So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a combination of lack of vision in terms of what, what, what do I want and asking mm. themselves the question of what I actually want lack of the mechanical mechanism to actually get there mm. um, and the skill gap. Um, you know, I mean, realistically, it all starts with like, what do you actually want out of your business? What mm. do you want it to give you? What do you want it to look like? What do you want it to feel like? I know that can sound a little bit airy fairy, mm. but it's like, really, what do you, what do you really want this business to give you? And what do you, how do you want it to position you? What, what kind of life do you want out of it? Um, and then, okay, what are the targets? What is the, the mechanical action steps to get there that you need to do day in day out how are you going to evaluate it who do you need help with who do you need support with and when are you going to start it, i mean there's, there's an, an almost a parallel back to the diagnosis of yeah very much so yeah you know, the, the um yeah diabetes you know it's this is what's happened you yeah i mean foggy I, eyesight yeah 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 you know? i mean i i uh bump into so many business owners to say i want a six-figure business this year uncle great how's that working out for you mm. i haven't got it yet okay why I don't know. What are you going to do about it? Just work harder. That's not accurate enough. Sure. You know what I mean? Like you're going to, you, you know, appreciate you can set plans and those plans can deviate. I always say make a plan, but prepare to make a detour. Okay. Um, and also with targets as well, you know, set your initial targets based on what you know and what you feel right mm. now, but mm. don't be afraid to lower, higher. Mm. Yeah. So in terms of, I mean, that that mindset side, where do you tend to lean to in terms of, I mean, you mentioned before, I think it was John, yeah, and, and, uh, John D. Martini in terms of the, yeah. the, the mentor side. You know? John's great, yeah. I mean, um, I think you put, might have heard that on Rob's podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John's been great. There's, there's a load of other, like, you know, John has been, uh, the reason why I warmed to John was because he was a polymath, he was into physiology, he was a chiropractor, and that's my background, and he's sure. into the, the, the actual science of the physiology. That's how I initially got, uh, uh, brought on by his bandwidth. Mm -hmm. um, D. Hawking's stuff's amazing spirituality wise. Um, Dr. Joe Dispenza. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, what I'm looking for there is nuggets or perspectives. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, Tony Robbins, you know, um, you know, we, you know we, we live in a day and age now where people are criticizing these people that are doing humongous feats for humanity my guru is better than your guru like like what the fuck are you like serious like you know if somebody's getting value out of someone and shifts their perspective and they're getting a more meaningful life out of it shut the fuck up mm. do you know what i mean and like when i see stuff like that oh i've worked with such and such and i've worked like come on like mm. are, they, are they serving humanity are they making the world a better place sure. like all that stuff with tony robbins on like well i think it was buzzfeed I don't know if you saw all that stuff no. about the stuff that you, like, you had like 
like, like touched one of his clients like 17 years ago and like on the shoulder and she brought up a, a sexual assault case and stuff. And it's just like, you know, when you're a hero, people are going to try to take you out. Yeah, totally. And I've had experience of that. Mm. Um, I can talk about it if you want. Um, this is pretty, pretty, uh, a lot of people in Northern Ireland will know about it. But, you know, when you're at the height, you are having people trying to take you out. Mm. No question about it. And you have to have, um, you know, your success in life is in direct proportion to the amount of criticism, ridicule, and just downright betrayal that you can keep up with, mm. you know? Um, so, you know, I'm not really, when I say that, is there, is there one person there? There's people that have been majorly influential, but it's a combination of people. And there have been certain people that have been more influential than others, but I would never harness my whole hope in one human being because that would just be idiotic Mm. because every human, there's blind spots, there's biases, there's no perfect human being in the earth, Mm. you know? Um, so I'm not really, you know, in terms of who's the best or who's this and that, I, I couldn't put a label on that, you know. So, so I mean, you, you touched on sort of spirituality there. I mean, is that, mm. is that something that's, well, is, is that? Well, I was brought up in a, in a Christian household, in a Protestant household, um, very much you're a sinner your whole life, blah, blah, blah brought up with a lot of conviction of like, you know, you're going to go to hell if you don't X, Y, and Z. That was very tough mm. mentally to, to get around that because, again, being conditioned to believe yeah. that. So I had to do a lot of work on theology and trying to actually study and look at, right, what's the substance behind a lot of the stuff that I've been taught and brought up with mm-hmm. in combination with my own personal experiences and all that kind of stuff and you know, to be honest, uh, I mean, I have views about it now, which I'd rather keep to myself, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, I'm in a very happy place now with, with where I'm at. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, above and, and outside of religion, I mean, do you feel, you know, universal connection and things like that? Or? Yeah, very much so. And I mean, I mean, we can, you know, delve into consciousness and all that kind of crazy stuff but i think that's beyond the scope of what most people would be prepared to listen to but you know i i I, the biggest most important thing for me is how can i serve humanity how can i love myself how can i be on a on a on a a real mission to help and contribute as much as i can and to know that you know that everything's already perfect as it is and that's quite i know that sounds quite overly simplistic Mm -hmm. but when you truly trying to get there in your own head and your own state of mind and when you begin to you know realize i think you know that no matter what you do or you don't do in life that you really are you know loved and worthy of love is a very grinding grinding belief to have Mm -hmm. you know and um there's nothing missing in your life i think you know there's a lot of times where i thought stuff was missing and when i didn't look at it the right way you know you know, dip my mood up and down and, you know, it's, it's being, it's, it's knowing how to to ask the right questions to get the the right answers in your head so you can live with clarity and peace of mind and calmness and Mm. poise and all that kind of stuff, you know. Do you tend, is that sort of a new day and day or do you tend to meditate or do you? I meditate every day. I do 10 to 30 minutes every day. Yeah. Okay. Did you, would you have a daily pattern? I mean, are you... Every, yeah, I'm very, very regiment. I'm, I'm disciplined, uh, not regiment. Okay. Difference? Yeah, so I have... I'm not the kind of guy that wakes up at 5.30 every morning, okay. uh, puts on a coffee with 28 grams of coffee, <laughs> goes in as a shower for eight minutes, and, you know, like... Sure. I've tried to do that. I've tried to do the whole, you know, super disciplined, up at half five and whatever. But, you know, how do you... You know, if you look at you as an individual, your day is that dynamic. You know, if you're getting up at half five every day, what happens if you have to, you're in flow at eight o'clock at night and you go to 12 o'clock or one o'clock and then you're waking up with four and a half hours sleep, underslept, you know, and your energy's all over the place. What do you do if you've got a, a circumstance that arises that, you know, you can't control and you're kept up later? What happens if you go on a social occasion where you're drinking alcohol and you're around thriving people that are inspiring you and you have to get up at half five and before you, so being able to be sort of flexible with that mm-hmm. has been a big, big thing. But in the morning I spend a lot of time, I spend an hour myself before I do anything else. Wow. 
um, just to prepare myself and stabilize myself for the day. Mm. Um, Cause I know my day is going to be full of challenges. It's going to be full of people that are going to try and trip me up, distract me. Um, I've got to be clear in what I'm thinking about. I've got clear outcomes that I need to hit by the end of the day. And I want to make sure that I'm in the best possible footing to do that. Um, one of the worst habits in the world that I see is people waking up. First thing is Instagram. First thing is messenger and whatever. And like, you know, I don't touch my mobile phone for, I get up in the morning and I, I try to get seven hours sleep a night. So mm-hmm. sometimes in the morning I get up at six, sometimes I get up at half five, sometimes I get up at eight. Depends on what time I go to bed. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll get up in the morning. The first thing that I'll do is I'll go for a run. I go for a run up around the statue there mm-hmm. and back. It's a 15 minute run. Mm-hmm. And uh, so if you see a guy with a hood uh, <laughs> and a pair of trackies looking seriously dodgy, it's me. <laughs> uh, running by your house at whatever time uh, I come back here I then meditate for 10 to 15 minutes Okay. and I, I say 10 minutes but I sometimes let it drift on until I just feel that I'm ready to just until I feel that I've come out of it or whatever sure. um, and that was that was quite a hard thing to train because when I first started meditating my head was so like so meditation is something that I've really stuck with and it is really like, you know, I couldn't do without it. It just stills me. Mm. Um, I then make a coffee, a massive into coffee of a Merzago downstairs. So I really take it seriously. I went all out on it because this is my work environment. So I want it absolutely dialed in. Sure. Um, I then go and read one chapter of a book and then I journal until I'm clear. Okay. Um, I then I, fo- to- I focus on the most highest priority task mm-hmm. of the day, which mm-hmm. is the hardest thing. And then I work, I used to work on a calendar and I've tried various different mechanisms and I am going to look at building a, some kind of planner for the stuff that I'm going to be doing. But I try to work on a calendar in terms of right time blocks for X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. That didn't really work for me because I was finding I was going over the times or I was under, the, it, it just turned it into a complete and utter mess. Mm-hmm. So what I do is I, the night before I go, okay, what is the outcome of tomorrow? Okay. Um, that can, it's one to three outcomes, no more. Um, I then go checklist and I basically list things in terms of priority, the hardest thing first to the easiest stuff, the last I get up in my morning and I work through that list methodically and I do 50 minute blocks all out, 10 minutes rest. If I go for another block, I'll never do more than two blocks in a row without taking a 30 minute to a 45 minute break. So I don't overtax the system. I work no more, no more than eight hours a day on a full out day Mm -hmm. and no more than five hours on a half day. And I've got those parameters and I force myself to rest. Um, the reason why is because I used to approach work with the, the, the mindset of all out, fucking go until you bleed. And what was happening was I was getting blunt. My decision making was getting poor. I was then taking the calls and messages and stuff outside of my, in, in my personal time. And I was just riddled with anxiety, riddled with constant connection, uh, feeling blunt, approaching hard tasks, not getting them completed and then minimizing myself because you hadn't done them. And you know, like when you're a bodybuilder, you know, you're going to talk to yourself like, like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Like you need to get this done. Let's execute. You know what I mean? Um, so it's a very like, bam, 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 get it done. You know? And if you know anybody that knows me, it's one of those, yeah, Phil will get it done. Phil will do it. It's, you know, that's the kind of guy that I want to be. Um, so, you know, that's how I approach, in terms of journaling, you asked, how do I do it? Um, I ask myself a series of questions, um, but some of the time it's free flow writing. Sure. How I feel about my head, it's like a dissecting, it's like a dissecting tool, it's a cleaning tool. Um, I did try to do it digitally on the iPad with an app called Grid Diary, which was great, look great, whatever, but there's nothing that beats writing it. Mm. Um, problem with writing it is sometimes when you go to write it, somebody finds your fucking journal, you're fucked. <laughs> right? So, yeah, so you get that fucker locked up, right? So, um, yeah. Um, I think that was a, a hurdle for me for a while was like, you know, I'm really putting some personal shit in here. Um, do you tell, is it, is it a, is it a personal dialogue or do you tend to, oh, it's, more gratitude yeah. or is it just a, Oh, it's a, a flow of consciousness. It's a brain dump of what I'm struggling with right now, how it's served me, what I want to do. It's a mixture of gratitude. It's a mixture of reflections. It's a mixture of action plans, action steps. Mm. People, like, it's everything. Mm. You know? In terms of gratitude and stuff like that, you know, like, you know, you've got to sit and write a fairy tale and whatever. Like, you know, that, that's not really constructive to me. There has to be an element of gratitude in terms of what went well today mm-hmm. or what went well yesterday or what are you excited about, whatever, or 
And then, you know, like the way I work with my, my journal, and this works for me, it might not work for everyone, is you see when I'm having a really shitty day, I went, what went well today? What went bad today? Normally the stuff that went bad is like one or two things. What went well today? It's like, and it's like a perspective shift. Okay. Um, but when I write my journal, it's not all about like, you know, what am I grateful for? I'm, like, sometimes when you're writing that shit, you're like writing stuff for the sake of fucking writing it to say oh. that it's there. So what I would sometimes do in that case is like, what am I really struggling with? I'm struggling with this and I don't know X, Y, and Z. Okay, then I draw a line. What are the potential options? Option one, option two, right? What makes the most sense right now? This one, okay, when are you going to action it? This date, who are you going to speak to first? This guy. Mm. So that's more constructive for me. Sure. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, you know, I'm grateful for the air. I'm grateful for the birds. Like, how many times can you write that? Mm. I mean, you're going to drive yourself insane writing that. There are times when I will write stuff like that. Thank you so much for being alive. Thank you so much for this beautiful weather. But, you know, like the stuff that I'm struggling with is the stuff that I want to solve and I can only solve it when I find solutions to it. So I'm a problem solver. Mm. You say, yeah. I mean, is that one of your skill sets or what would you say is your highest skill? Articulation. Okay. Being able to articulate myself in mm. with my industry, with, with, with my area of sure. expertise. Communication, articulation and being direct to the point um, and getting stuff done. Yeah. Because you had talked almost a bit of a, a simplification of... You know, being, being able to pre- represent. Yeah. Looking at where you're at, looking at the challenges, looking at the action steps and making it super simple and fucking direct. Mm. Go. Mm. People value that. I, you know, like, you know, like people don't value complicated stuff. People don't value flaky details. People value, you know, if you want to achieve anything in life, you need, you need a handful of things. You need a fucking plan. Mm. You need the right training to fill your skill gaps. Mm-hmm. You need the right support. Yep. You need some form of accountability and you need to be around people that are doing the fucking same thing. Sure. So, you know, like what's what's missing there? So, you know, like those are very, very important things for me. Mm. You know? In terms then of the accountability side, I mean, how, how do you get that? I mean, you're... So, yeah, that's a very good question. So I have uh, a large part of my day, a large part of my month, a large part of my year is spent alone, mm. Right. And I was asked this question the other week at an event. Um, how do you handle the loneliness of being an entrepreneur? Well, my mission and my my work is my best friend. Mm-hmm. That's what I confide in. That's what I work in. I have periodic charge points where I go over to my own masterminds, my own events, which are private events of individuals that are very well known, very well respected in their specific fields. And we sit around a table and we go, what are you fucking struggling with? Mm-hmm. Here's a group think on it. What are you struggling with? Here's a group think on it. And it doesn't matter if somebody's in a different industry, it allows me to either soundboard. So the where I'm at in my life right now, in my specific industry, it's not necessarily about filling skills within the, 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 the whole marketing and sales and business side of things. Sure. It's about soundboarding. Am I doing the right thing mm-hmm. or am I doing the wrong thing? Okay. Here's what I'm doing. What do you think? Good, bad. Okay, what could be better? Mm-hmm. Whatever. It's not about how to. Mm-hmm. It's more about a, here's the strategy here's the chess pieces, here's the way I'm going to be moving this, here's the way I'm going to be moving that. Is that the right move first? What would you do better? Um, so, I mean, being around people like that, I mean, yeah, I've got a very, very healthy peer group, but we don't live in each other's shoes. Sure. You know, I'd see those guys maybe four times a year, mm-hmm. odd message here and there, but I don't need, I don't, you know, I don't need to be around sure. somebody every day. Yeah. It's tough to do. I think that, that's the thing is not everyone needs to, you know. Uh, again, be- again, some people need more hand-helding than others. I mean, I'm just reflecting what I need. And um, if you're an individual that's just starting out, you may find that you need your hand held mm. for a long proportion of time. You may have a lot of questions and stuff like that. But, um, you know, uh, I have a number of, like all my, all, like I'm 32, all my friends are late 40s, 50s. I go out walking with a guy across the street, the multi, multi-millionaire. We go out walking around the park and I just spill out what's in my head. I talk about, you know, I value stuff like that. I couldn't go to the football with the lads or anything like that. I, I'm very easily, um, I, 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 most people my age, I don't sure. socialize with because they're, 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 their values are different and they don't appreciate the what I'm trying to do. Sure. You know, um, and that was even the case whenever I was, 
you know, younger, I mean, I was a, a very dedicated bodybuilder and I would have gone out and nights out with friends and stuff. They would have all been drinking. I would have been there sober. I would have nipped out to the car and had my meals. I would have sat there and just thought about the show and stuff like that and gone back out. People say that's a weirdo, but I was a fucking man on a mission. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to apologize for that. Mm. That was me. And you take it, you either take it or you leave it. That's a passion. I mean, I would say as it's yeah. a fire in the belly. It's non-negotiable. Yeah. It's happening. Yeah, it's non-negotiable, hundred percent. You know, that's just how it's happening. This is how it's going down, and mm. you're either on my side or you're not. It takes a lot of core strength. It does. Uh, it it does. Strength. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, what was that giving you? Well, that's giving me self-control. Okay. And you know, from bodybuilding, you know, one of the big things about bodybuilding is whenever I was pushing myself and, you know, going through all the discipline, the, 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 the main thing that was fueling that was uh, internally me saying, right, prove to yourself what you're capable of. Okay. Prove to yourself that you're disciplined enough. Prove to yourself that you've got control and mastery of your mind, of your body to be able to go through this and coordinate it. Mm. So it was like a, almost like a, a self-control and sure. a master, like I, I want to prove to myself that I'm capable of reaching my full potential and giving my best to reach that potential. And that there's no stone, not one fucking pebble unturned to get there. What are you capable of? There's no, there's no. Do you know? No, I don't know, no. Mm. But I know I'm capable of a lot more. Mm. And that's what the whole point of daily reflection is and going, right, where could I have done better? What could I, you know, there's things today. I'll sit and reflect tonight. There's things today already that I know that I could be doing better with, right? But you imagine a life that's inspected like that, mm. you know? I just want to get the best out of life. Sure. And I want to be the best fucking machine, the most optimized human being that I can be in order to just enjoy everything that this life has. I want to live as long as I can. You know, I want to help as many people as I can. Um, and I want to really just discover more about me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I can only do that if I'm, you know, uh, personal development is about looking back at your life. What were the challenges? What was I stuck with? How can I improve it? And, and using that to move forward. Sure. You know, I don't live with, I don't live with regret. I don't live with, you know, all this kind of stuff. I mean, what's the point in living with regret if you're trying to develop your life? It's the opposite, you know? So, um, yeah, I hope, I hope that's useful. I, you know, um, I'm quite extreme in my thinking sometimes and how I express no, it, this stuff. I mean, it showed, to me, it, it shows a very evolved method of thinking. Yeah. I, I like, you know, like I said, I'm still very much in my infancy and learning as a student, but, you know, I would, I'm very confident that my head's screwed on, my heart's in the right place. And, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm focused on becoming better and doing as best I can, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the people around you, I mean, how do you, do you, are you good at protecting yourself or, or preserving yourself? Yeah. What's growing yourself? Yeah, very much so. Um, I very much protect what goes in, what goes out. I don't look at anything that's going to potentially distract me or annoy me. Um, sometimes it comes up in my in, in my face. Um, I think social media is one of those things, you know, like uh, I, you'll not find me browsing socials. You'll not find me following people that, you know, I, the only people that I follow are people that are going to inspire me. Mm. I don't spend a lot of time on it. If I want to get inspired, I'll go and read. I'll go and connect with my my peers. Um, you know, I'm not. I'm more busy on trying to build my own life rather than trying to look at what other people are doing. Mm. You know, which is um, hard to do in this day and in life. You know, depends. Depends on how you control your environment. Depends on how disciplined you are. I mean, I have no notifications on my phone. I have no Facebook app on my phone. Okay. Um, I have my Instagram and all that kind of stuff delegated out. I go in and look at stuff when I need to. I'll put up stories when I need to. Um, I have my emails and other bits and pieces delegated out. Um, there's only certain places that I need to exist and that I need to operate on. If I get caught up in that kind of stuff, it's slowing me down. Mm. You know, at the end of the day, the people are contacting me for a handful of reasons and they've all been extracted, put out and systemized. Sure. So they're still getting the solutions that they want. Yeah. You know. In terms of then, I suppose client wise and things. I mean, where do you see the the you know, the, the the greatest potential for win in that? I mean, uh, you know, is is it the systemization side, or what sort of where are the blockages, as you see? That really depends on the business. Um, but the most important thing is getting you know working smarter, not harder. Okay. Um, I mean that's an open ended question. I mean, you know, it's not necessarily always. 
lead generation in terms of attracting clients. It's not always sales. A lot of the times it's systems. Most people don't know what systems are and they continue to go through stupid things and do, you know, inefficient tactics and strategies to get the result, which mm. can be systemized. There's the, that's very open-ended. It's, it's really, I think one of the biggest gifts that I can give someone is making them excited about their future mm. instead of fearful of it. Sure. That's coming from a, coming from a positive place is, uh, for me, it's, it's, the pain is more motivating to begin with, but then the, the, the pleasure is where you want to be. Yeah. I mean, Sometimes I'm one of those guys that if there's too much good shit happening, you're <laughs> like, okay, I'm about to get slapped up the mouth here. <laughs> so I got to make sure that I'm not getting complacent. And that has happened in my life a lot. Okay. Um, in my earlier days, um, you know, uh, I had a lot of success as a younger, younger entrepreneur in terms of not just financially, but more reputation and significance mm. from a very young age and there was parts of me that was that you know too big for my boots pride came before a fall okay. and you know i got slapped up the face a few times so you know, what was it mike tyson says everything's going great until you get punched in the face right? <laughs> so yeah i mean that's uh so yeah i don't get i don't get high on my own supply oh. um I always try to center myself as much as I can. Any uh, sort of different jobs and careers you've had along the lines, or is it? Um, yeah, I've worked. Uh, uh, well, if we reverse it backwards, and obviously business mentor and I, and personal trainer, dietitian, health promotion practitioner, food technologists, uh, food technology. Um, uh, what else? Bouncer, doorman. Sainsbury's news, newspaper boy, Tesco's shelf packer, um, uh, clean dishes in a restaurant. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Yeah. It's all all very interactive jobs. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's good. Life's been life's been good. You know. It's yeah. About trying to enjoy as much of it as possible. Sure. You know, and uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, and anything else you want to. Is on or no, that's the, I mean that's the the main thing I suppose to summarize fire in the belly. I mean, if you were to put it into one or a couple of words, I mean, what would it be for you? Fire in the belly. Hmm. I would probably say. Hmm, let me see. I think it's been excited to wake up in the morning and live another day, mm. and you know, just excited to get started with each day and almost excited to the point where what am I going to learn about myself today? Okay. What am I going to give the world today? And when you wake up and you know that you've got stuff to do, inspiring stuff to do, um, it's just a very exciting, it's just a very exciting feeling. I mean, you imagine a, a, a day with no to-do list or no mm. nothing to do. Um, and I think, I'll, you know, a large delusion of people is um, wanting to be so wealthy that they wake up and they don't have anything to do. And, uh, you know, if, if you were to give me 20 million pounds tomorrow and say you're financially free, go and spend that, I would still be doing what I'm doing. And I think that's a, you know, I've asked myself that question a lot, you know, and I think that's a very good indicator of mm. what you're doing as a true test. So, you know, I would still be running my business and trying to scale it and do everything that I could whilst also enjoy, enjoying the cash. Sure. You know what I mean? So I think if you said I was going to stop mm. or I'd go and take a big break or I'd stop for a while, I don't want to fucking stop. Mm. You know, so... Yeah. Do you turn? I mean, do you do you have to work at that as, as such, or does it something that comes intuitively to you? Well, I don't. Uh, do you have to work at that? Well, I suppose if you're going to ask me why am I still going and why am I still putting myself through all the challenges that come with the business, uh, the straight answer is that uh, I've lost count of the amount of people that have turned around to me and said that you've changed my life with tears in their eyes. 
and that is a I can't even put into words mm -hmm. what how valuable that is mm -hmm. um and that has happened a lot um you know my one of my mission statements with my business is i'm not i'm not worried i'm not worried about your business first i'm worried about changing your life first okay you know and that carries into the business thing mm. um and there's a lot of people that i have worked with that have come from nothing or no confidence that have now grown to become leaders in their own right and their own businesses and, and that has been done repetitively over the years mm. that's not talk you go and do the research you go and ask there are case study after case study after case study you ask anybody in the industry about my name or anything like that you, you'll find that the results are at the center of it so it's yeah that that's uh a big reason why i continue to do it mm. because mm. me teaching them is me only teaching them what i fucked up with like that's that's all it is and mm. if i'm teaching them i'm actually being able to learn more about myself sure. so there's a whole self there's a whole self-development uh, i can't or i can't sort of express it in when i teach them i learn more about myself and i'm sure. and, and, and I'm teaching from a place that i've been myself mm. does that make sense teaching is another form of learning yeah yeah you know so it's, it's like yeah so you know well if you if you learn to learn or you learn to tell or learn to teach there yeah. are different very different methods of learning mm. yeah yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah, was, yeah. i was always interested because i think it was john d martin talked about you know their their voids you know what's it your voids or your values which i always thought was a very curious statement mm -hmm. and well it, it, you know john talks a lot about axiology which is a study of human values that's mm. the actual ology of it um and if you have something missing in your life it's something that you want so you'll do everything in your power to achieve that mm. and you know it's like you know if you were for example overweight for years and years and you wanted a thin body and all of a sudden you see those people turn into health fanatics and i was one of them mm -hmm. you know we see people that have gone to extreme poverty um that have become millionaires that's one of them not everybody leans in yeah um you know um but john martini and his his values and how he communicates and articulates that uh you know he's a master of what he does he's very very good at what he does not everybody's cup of tea, cup of tea but john for me is one of the most inspiring men on the planet mm. um, without a shadow of a doubt um and he doesn't stop like i've never met a man that like that guy is so dedicated to his his mission that it's just inspiring and he's, he's changed so many lives and i've seen it i've, I've physically seen it uh, in the room i've been at many of john's events over the years and you know if anybody ever gets a chance to to go to any of that go to it but you know again make sure it's aligned with who you are and mm -hmm. what you want to you know i'm not saying john's the the be all end all like find out what's right for you and go there but you know mm -hmm. go there with an open mind that's the most important thing i think i saw him and my conscious mind sort of got up and walked out because <laughs> the volume and, and the, the depth of what she speaks is yeah so john's very detailed very technical mm -hmm. very in-depth and if you're not one of the, you're not a detailed person you're not a detailed person mm -hmm. i'm a detailed guy mm -hmm. so you know you know if you meet you know rob you interviewed mm -hmm. very direct very straight very detail oriented just mm -hmm. very like structured so sure. you're going to resonate with mm -hmm again it's, it's you know it's what works for you i mean i think again another life lesson on that is a large error not error but miss miss sort of miss i'm not sure the word there but a, a sort of a, a mishap with my thinking was everybody thought like me okay. back when i was younger so you know they should be doing that he should be doing that mm. she should be doing that why are they not doing that and then I get frustrated at myself, you know. So, you know, I think that's another thing as well. It's like finding what works for you. Mm. You know, because you're saying there, you know, the, the, your first thing is to change, almost change the person, you know, before you actually mm -hmm. you can move on. I mean, what does that look like for you? Well, I mean, as a person, you've got to line up. Well, what do you really want to get out of life? What do you want to do? How do you want to spend your time? What do you want to do with your day? How do you want to make your money? How do you want to serve? You know, asking those questions first, and then looking at your your layers i mean like your environment first you know your habits your routines your rituals your values the whole way up to your mission you know your self-identity and mm. there's a lot of 
you know, there's a lot of ele- elements there that you have to have your ducks in a row first before you can start going after something. Mm. I mean, everybody, you know, I always used to ask the question when I did seminars back in the day of how many people in this room want to lose weight? Everybody put their hand up. How many people have actually lost weight? So the need isn't explicit enough. It's, mm. it's only, a, you know, everybody wants to be rich, sure. make money, but nobody knows the taxes involved, the VAT, the all look like, you know, there's a lot of different problems that happen when you start making money. Sure. You're worried about losing it. All of a sudden you start getting you know, emails from financial advisors and <laughs> life insurance. Something gets serious. Mm. Yeah, 100%. So, yeah. No, it is. It's, uh, and, and do you tell, I mean, you, you talked about sort of liking the detail and there's quite a, quite a strong smile on your face, you know. Yeah. In the likes of events or the day to day or the planning and, and things that you do, I mean, are you do, you do you delve into the detail? Is that your thing or? Uh, every event that we run, I go right. How do I want everyone to feel after it? What needs to happen at the event and the flow of the event? Like our events are very smooth, very calculated. You, you know, you walk into the room and you'll walk out with a solution. It's, that's just the fucking way it is. Nobody leaves the room until they've got something fixed. And, you know, we have a team and all that help with that. It's, after having done so many of them, they're not that hard to, yeah. to they're, they're basically, we've got a formula now and that we use in terms of the type of people that's in the room and we run through with that. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we have uh, the last event it's in the merchants all over social media, even the merchant hotel commenting us, inviting us back down and saying, we want you to do that again. It was great socials. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, good to be. Yeah. Well, listen, Phil, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I know how much work goes into these podcasts and you've travelled here to, to do it, so I'm very yes. grateful for that. No, listen, it's, uh, it's great, and thank you for sharing your story. And uh, No problem. I hope that was interesting. I hope I haven't put anybody <laughs> to, to, to sleep. But, yeah, thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing your plans and see where you go from thank here. Thank you so much. Lovely. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Take care. Appreciate thank it. Thank you.